Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear saints, as we gather on this eve of the nativity of our Lord, and as we hear the Christmas story once again, at least as it's recorded by St. Luke, we typically hear about those circumstances, about the poverty of the couple, the poverty in which Christ our Lord was born. But this year on this Christmas Eve, I would like to think more about Paul's words to Titus that are appointed for this evening that we heard read a moment ago. Because Paul's words to Titus teach us not the circumstances of Christ's birth, not the details of it as St. Luke does, but it teaches us the reason for Christ's birth in Bethlehem. So that we may do more this evening than simply meditate on and consider the circumstances of the first Christmas. St. Paul writes to Titus, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And tonight, that's precisely what we are celebrating. This glorious appearing of Christ's, or rather, God's grace in Christ Jesus, the favor of God the Father, which brings salvation. For God has shown his grace to us in manifold ways. First, in creating us and placing us as the crown of his creation, living in the midst of this beautiful world. God's grace is also shown to us in the way in which he daily provides for all of our needs. And the grace of God, though, which St. Paul specifically describes, is that which brings salvation. And that is precisely what we celebrate tonight and for the next 12 days. That is precisely what we hear about in St. Luke's Gospel, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, just as the angels told the shepherds in the fields on the outskirts of Bethlehem. The angel of the Lord appears before this shepherd, the shepherds rather, and says, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. And what are those glad tidings of great joy? For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. This is how God manifests his grace that brings salvation. A baby born to poor parents. A baby swaddled. A baby sleeping in a cattle trough. And how does this child reveal the grace of God that brings salvation? He shows God's grace by being to all people, as the angel says. Not just some people, not just certain people, not just a small segment or portion of the population of the world, but to all people, all men, all women, all children. Just as St. John writes, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God's love and grace is for all mankind, so that if you ever find yourself wondering, well, are these glad tidings really for me? Then you should ask yourself, do I live in the world? And of course, the answer is yes. For the glad tidings of great joy are for all people. So these glad tidings are for you, even as they are for me. And the apostles of Christ echo this message as well. St. Paul says to the Corinthians, he died for all. St. John tells us in his first epistle that he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. God places no limitation on this grace that he gives for the salvation of mankind, but desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so, there is no one exempt from these glad tidings. And the glad tidings of great joy are this. Not just that any child is born, but that this child who is born is born as Savior. That's what the child's name means, after all. He'll be me named on the eighth day of Christmas, on the day of the circumcision. And on that day, then, his parents will give him the name that the angel told them both to give to him. 
The angel specifically told Joseph in a dream in Matthew 1 21, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And how does he do this? He saves his people from their sins by dying for those sins, making satisfaction for the sins of the entire world, for every depraved thought, for every wicked word spoken, and for every deed that violates the pure standard of God's law, whether it is an external thing or something in the heart and mind. This child, as a man, will pay for each and every one of our sins so that all who repent of their sins, so that all who trust his atoning death, have that perfect forgiveness which he earns. And not only do they have this perfect forgiveness for every sin, but they possess Christ's perfect righteousness as well. For this child will live under God's law and will do so perfectly, righteously, he will fear, love, and trust God the Heavenly Father above all things at all times. He will love his neighbor as he loves himself in every and all situations, every waking moment of his life. He is perfectly righteous. And he is perfectly righteous for us who are unrighteous in every way. So that everyone who repents of their sins and trusts Christ for their salvation not only has the complete forgiveness of all of their sins, but also they possess this child's perfect righteousness. So that when God sees them, that he sees the righteousness of Christ. This is how this child manifests God's grace. By saving sinners from their sins, from death, and from all the power of the devil. And this grace of God, which brings salvation, is not merely something to be commemorated once a year. It is something to be believed each and every day of our lives. It is something to be lived each and every day of our lives. For we live in this grace of God by daily repenting of our sinfulness. We daily live in this grace of God by believing the promises that he makes to us in the gospel that he will gladly, and that he is willing to forgive every sin as often as we come to him in penitence, and that he does in fact see us as righteous because we wear Christ as our righteousness by faith. And then we are to live each day as people who have actually been forgiven, as people whom God actually sees as righteous. The grace of God that brings salvation teaches us, Paul says, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. We deny ungodliness because by faith we are sons of God. We deny ungodliness and we chase after godliness. We deny worldly lusts because by faith God purifies our hearts and consciences. And so we deny ourselves those lusts which formerly defiled us. And so we live soberly, righteously, and even godly in this present age. We live as people who have truly heard and who truly believe that these glad tidings of great joy are for all people, even these people, even me. And since we enjoy the grace of God that brings salvation. Paul says we forsake everything that contradicts that salvation which has been bestowed upon us by our triune God. The entire reason why Jesus has come, the entire reason why God the Son became flesh and assumed our humanity, the entire reason that he gave himself for us in his life and in his death, St. Paul says, is that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. The grace of God that has appeared to all men, that brings salvation. It hasn't appeared to forgive our sins and then leave us in them. The grace of God in Christ Jesus hasn't appeared to all men so that we may then continue in our sins, imagining that 
grace will continue to abound. For to believe the free and the complete forgiveness of sins and yet remain in sins will be to cast out the very faith that looks to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. To receive Christ's righteousness. Only to continue in our sins and continue to enjoy them would be to make a mockery of Christ's righteousness and his suffering and death for our sins. No, Christ has come to save us from our sins and to purify us, to collect us into his own special people, the church, the body of believers. For we are Christ's special people because he makes us sons and daughters of his by faith in his only begotten Son. He gives us his righteousness and his Holy Spirit then, so that we may be zealous for good works, as the Apostle says. Zealous in good works toward God, like faith and prayer and praise and learning his word. And zealous for good works towards our neighbor. Loving them as we love ourselves. Serving them as they need. And we can only do these works because Christ has redeemed us from every lawless deed and has purified us from all unrighteousness. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It appeared when Christ was born. It was announced by angels, seen by shepherds, and treasured by his mother Mary. And God's grace continues to appear to men for their salvation as often as we hear of Christ. Not just his birth in the flesh, but as often as we hear of any part of his life, since his entire life was for us and our salvation. The grace of God that brings salvation appears to us, to us so that we no longer live in our sins, so that we are no longer estranged from the true God, but so that all who believe this salvation for themselves belong to him as his own special people, who are zealous to continue to abide in God's word and work. Tonight, and for the next 12 days, we rejoice in this sign given to the shepherds by the angel, a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. It was a sign unto them where they might find the Savior in the midst of a bustling Bethlehem. But that is still a sign for us as well. A sign of the grace of God that brings salvation, that it has in fact appeared to all men so that we may not die in our sins and live under the tyranny of the devil, that we might by faith be redeemed and purified to be God's own special people. Amen. May the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue by singing... Stanzas 9 through 15 of hymn 85. 